honourable members, the Speaker. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament. Direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I uh, wish to correct the record in relation to one aspect of the debate on the privacy amendment, private yeah. sector bill. Attorney General is seeking indulgence to correct the record and may proceed. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, as I said, I wish to correct a record in relation to one aspect of the debate on the Privacy Amendment Private Sector Bill in the House on the 8th of November 2000. In comparing the application of the national privacy principles to existing data in the Bill to the law that applied when the Public Sector Privacy Act was introduced in 1998, 1988, I said that the Retrospective aspects of the bill mirror the provisions that applied to the public sector at the time that the public sector provisions of the Privacy Act 1988 were introduced. That's at Hansard, page 22387. My department had provided this advice but has now re-examined the issue. I'm now advised that the position under the bill is more complex than my statement might suggest. The broad approach in section 15 of the Privacy Act 1988 and clause 16C of the Privacy Amendment Private Sector Bill is the same in that some principles will apply to all information whenever collected and some only to information collected after commencement. However, it's necessary to consider the position in relation to each particular issue. For instance, I acknowledge that in relation to the particular issue of access to and correction of personal information, the position under the proposed bill is that the relevant NPP on this issue only applies to information collected after the commencement of the bill. The explanatory memorandum on the bill makes this clear. In this respect, the position does not mirror the position under the 1988 Act. In certain other respects, such as National Privacy Principles 1 and 4, the position in relation to collection and security of information under the bill is consistent with the position taken in relation to those issues under the Act. Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I, I wish to raise a matter of unfinished business yesterday. Are you going to ask the, the, uh, the, the Minister for Education Services to withdraw unconditionally? The, the, the minister, a little less help from the member for Jagger Jagger would go a long way. The minister will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Uh, Mr Speaker, what, what I was uh, going on to say was the minister who got to the table. Uh, we are seeking, as we saw it yesterday before he after he exited the chamber, an unconditional withdrawal as all other members of this House are obliged to make in similar circumstances. The Leader of the Opposition, may, as is evident, the Minister for Employment Services is seeking the call. The Attorney General has been given precedent because the matter raised by him was a matter that could have been interpreted as uh, uh, unwittingly misleading the House, which clearly was not his intent, and it seemed to me for that reason to have precedent, and so the Attorney General was granted appropriate precedent. The Minister of Employment Services. The, I, I will uh, invite the Minister, in the interests of the House, to resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business. Mr. Speaker, our concern is not that you allowed the Attorney General to speak first. That was proper. Our concern is not that the, the, this Minister. It is a point of order. I do not need any help from the member for Mitchell or any other members on my right. The manager of opposition business is being granted a good deal of latitude, as he knows, and he's aware of what is about well, to happen. The point of what order point I'm seeking to raise is that, that, Mr. Speaker, not that this minister be given leave to make a statement, but that you require him to withdraw the remark. That's what happens to everybody the else. Manager of opposition they business are required will resume to withdraw unconditionally. Manager of opposition business will resume his seat.
as will be evident to everyone in the House, it's not the right of any member of the House to dictate the terms to the chair. I have had no conversation with the Minister for Employment Services other than the conversation that I had already relayed to the manager of opposition business uh, yesterday evening. And, uh, the Minister for Employment Services indicated that he wishes to address the House, and I recognise him. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, seek your indulgence briefly to clear up an apparent misunderstanding. Oh, no. oh, sit down. No, you don't Minister of Employment Services will resume his seat. Leader of the Opposition. The point of order is simply this. A Member of Parliament has required him to withdraw a uh, statement that he made yesterday. That is all the matter that ought to be before Leader the House. Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Leader of the House. My point of order is that uh, you have provided them. I understand that uh, uh, you intend to provide the Minister with indulgence, and that does not provide an opportunity for uh, debating by the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. The leader of the opposition, the leader of the opposition, will resume his seat. As the occupier of the chair, I will in fact listen closely to what the Minister of Employment Services has to say, and then respond appropriately in the interests of all members. The The Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you. I refer to page 476 of House of Representatives Practice, Mr Speaker. How can giving leave to the Minister to make a statement meet the requirements of the standing orders that, having been asked to withdraw, a, a, spe a member must withdraw immediately in a respectful manner, unreservedly and without conditions or qualifications? How can a statement meet that requirement? The Leader of the House. The order is uh, very simple, Mr Speaker, and that is it is uh, uh, clear from your remarks that you intend to give the Minister the opportunity to address the House. Under those, circumst under those, circ under those circumstances, whatever might be the uh, issues that the Opposition wants to raise, they can't be raised by way of phony points of order uh, to prevent, to prevent the, the Minister from addressing the House. Uh, they have their problems, Mr Speaker, on the, the opposition man, side. The uh, we, we've the all read the Daily the Telegraph today, the the House page will one. His seat. The Leader of the House. The Leader of the House will resume his seat. The Leader of the House will resume his seat. The House will come to order. The House. The Leader of the Opposition. That, uh, that has just been raised. I would have thought the appropriate precedence is this. You can, of course, give indulgence to any member of the House as you see fit at any point of time. But the unfinished business here surely would take precedence over any indulgence. It is a simple matter, a request for a withdrawal. Simple, ordinary matter. It happens every day in this chamber and every day you exercise your authority. If after he has withdrawn you are prepared to give him some sort of indulgence, well, that's a matter entirely for you. But uh, what, is, uh, what is there in precedence is that uh, he, we now have the first opportunity of this minister being in the House after he has been required to withdraw us or requested to withdraw a statement from a member of parliament who has been offended by something that he has said, and that ought to take precedence over anything else he does. This is the last. This is the last occasion that I will recognise a point of order on the current ruling before me. I recognise the Leader of the House. Well, thank you for your uh, patience, uh, Mr Speaker, um, but uh, the facts are that the Minister has not been asked to withdraw by you. Uh, so the submit what, the leader of the what the Leader of the Opposition is attempting to do, Mr Speaker, is to, is to beguile you into preventing the Minister uh, from uh, addressing the House, which you indicated was your intention. And we simply invite you to proceed with your stated intention without further Leader delay. Leader of the House will resume his seat. I've indicated to the Manager of Opposition Business that, in fact, I have taken this as far as I intend to take in terms of an absurd— You have 
I, 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 member for Sturt. Member for Sturt. At the great risk of diluting the authority of the chair, I recognise the manager of opposition business. He knows the spirit in which I concede that to him. At that point. But, Mr Speaker, you've just said correctly that there's a ruling before the chair. Can you tell us what the ruling is? Are you ruling that he does not have to withdraw and that you are not going to require him to withdraw? Is that your the ruling? The manager of opposition business will resume his seat. For the information of all members, there is a matter um, which was exacerbated by my misunderstanding of a statement yesterday. Following that, I spoke briefly to the Minister for Employment Services, who was in transit to Melbourne, and I indicated to him that the House would be facilitated if he would um, come into the House and make a statement. I, I do not. Be, uh, I have a great deal of confidence. I have a great deal of confidence in the common sense of all members of. I have a great deal of confidence in the common sense of all members of this chamber. I do not believe that the Minister for Employment Services seeks in any way to um, at, in fuel the difficult to fuel. Would not facilitate the House in any way if the Chair were forced to take disciplinary action on any member of the House at this particular point in time. My conversation with the Minister followed the remarks that are being referred to in the Chamber. I, in fact, invite the Minister to clarify the matters that were raised yesterday. No, and, and I will take action if I consider his action has been inappropriate following the conversation I had with him. The Minister. The minister, leader, the minister has been recognised, and the, the minister has had no opportunity. Look, there has, there has been, there has been no ruling. I have in, I, I am, as in, there has been no ruling. I, I am merely inviting the minister to come to the dispatch box and claret and clarify a matter which I have already discussed with him, and I recognise the minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker uh, uh, my comment in the House yesterday, uh, how can you the keep minister the minister cannot be heard above the hubbub. When you're taking their money, uh, was clearly a reference to the Australian Democrat Party, which the member for Dixon then led. It was not a reference to the member for Dixon personally. The, the, leader, the, the leader of the opposition the leader, the leader of the opposition the leader of the opposition's comments will not as yet be recorded because I had not recognized him. The leader of the opposition. Mr Speaker, I formally again ask that he withdraw his comments of yesterday. And I will read these comments to you because what he has just said is an out and out lie. And I will, the leader I will, of the opposition. I, the leader I will of the opposition. No, an out and out untruth. The, the leader of the opposition will. The leader of the opposition will proceed. The, uh, the statement he made yesterday, and I'm now reading from it. She issued a press release. And now, Mr. Speaker, yesterday the member for Dixon, responding to a misleading statement from ACOS, issued a press release. Mr. Speaker, she issued a press release. Mr. Speaker, she didn't do live media, lest she be asked the obvious question. How can you keep the so-and-sos honest when you're taking their money? How can you keep the so-and-so honest when you're taking their money? There's nothing generic about that, Mr Speaker. The member for, the member for Dixon was repeatedly identified as the person who had taken the money in that particular statement. It was an allegation, therefore, and the clear implication of a bribe. We require an unreserved withdrawal right now. The Leader of the House.
The member for Longman. I just. I would be very disappointed if, in order to get an opportunity to stress the House, I had to rise. In a genuine effort to clarify this matter, I invited the Minister for Employment Services to make a statement. I distinctly heard him say that he was uh, in no way reflecting on the member for Dixon as an. And I will. And I distinctly heard him say that he was separating the member for, for Dixon from member for Dixon. I manager of the business will, will resume his seat. I distinctly heard him. Member for Wentworth. I distinctly heard him say that he was separating the member for Dixon from any reference that he made yesterday. I now ask him I now ask him if in fact that was precisely what he did and if he withdraw and uh, if he withdraws any inference that the member for Dixon was in receipt of any money. That was my understanding. That was my understanding. Now, the Leader of the Opposition. I believe that your ruling be dissented from. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, the, uh, uh, the fact of the matter is that there has not been a ruling. I would say to the Leader of the Opposition, uh, if, he, if he cares to move a motion, for the suspension of standing orders, I warn the member for Swan uh, to uh, to allow the matter to be debated. The government would uh, allow him, without gag, to move a suspension motion, and the minister will be very happy to respond to each to each and every one of your baseless uh, claims. The fact of the matter is, the government, Mr. Speaker, the government supports the minister. We support the, leader of the House what he says. Resume, The leader of the house will resume his seat. The Leader of the House will resume his seat. The The manager of opposition ministers may be seeking a great deal, but until the House is orderly, he will not be recognised. Manager of opposition business. I'm seeking a ruling from you on the standing order 75, 76 and 77. 75 says no member may use offensive words against any member, against either House or the Parliament or any member. 76 says all imputations of improper, improper motives and all personal reflections are highly disorderly. And 77 says, when any offensive or disorderly words are used, the speaker shall intervene. Yeah. Are you ruling that those words were neither offensive nor personal reflections nor disorderly? Given that some of the things which have required us to withdraw, including statements about him. Leader of the House seeking the call. Um, on, on a point of order, uh, Mr Speaker, the uh, fact is that you did not make a ruling. Now you are invited to establish a ruling uh, for the purposes of the opposition's games that they want to play in the House this morning. Mr Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker uh, there are forms of the House, and as the government has said, we are, we are, we are more than happy uh, to uh, not exercise uh, our rights to uh, gag any suspension motion. If they want to move a suspension motion, they should do so. But, Mr. Speaker, a request, 
a request to you to make a ruling simply for their political purposes is not a request which, in uh, uh, our view, Mr. Speaker, you should accede to. It's as simple as that. The manager of. The member for Kingston. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on the uh, on the point of order, I draw your attention to Standing Order 78, Speaker, to determine offensive words. When the attention of the Speaker is drawn to words used, he or she shall determine whether or not they are offensive or disorderly. There is no way that I, any of my predecessors, or I'm bold to suggest any of my successors, would do anything that in any way eroded the status and authority of any standing order, I hope, but in this instance particularly the standing orders referred to by the Manager of Opposition Business. In an effort to ensure that an, what could have been seen as an unfair reflection on the member for Dixon was appropriately dealt with. As the occupier of the chair, I both granted her more indulgence and is normally extended in a personal explanation yesterday afternoon, contacted the minister who was in transit, asked him to come in and make a statement which would ensure that there could be no suggestion that the member for Dixon had been implicated in the comments he made. And he not only did that this morning, but when I asked him to clarify the matter, indicated he had also withdrawn any statement he had made. For that matter, I for, for that for that reason, I believe that the matter had been entirely appropriately and fairly dealt with, and that the standing orders had been maintained. My belief is that the Hansard record will show that there is nothing that the that has been said by the. Minister for Employment Services that could in fairly impinge on the reputation of the member for Dixon. The Leader of the Opposition. I move that the Speaker's ruling be dissented from. The Speaker's ruling, which has just been given. The Leader of the Opposition resume his seat. The Leader of the House. Uh, Mr. Speaker, only a few moments ago the Opposition were asking you to make a ruling. You didn't make a ruling, so they, got up and, so they, so they get up and pretend that you've made a ruling. Now, the fact is, there has been, there has been no ruling. Uh, and, uh, Mr Speaker, on that basis, they have only one choice. We've offered it to them. They ought to move a motion to suspend standing orders, and then they can have their say. Um, no, 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 I am, the Leader of the Opposition has never been denied the call and is not being denied it now. I merely apply the rule that I have applied for over two years and that is that unless people can be heard, they will not be recognised. The, the member for Prospect, as an occupier of the chair, leader of the... I have... The, the, leader, the Leader of the Opposition. All right. With the motion that I have moved that the Speaker's ruling be dissented from. 
Mr. Speaker, as was uh, pointed the out, the leader to of the you... opposition, I am not aware. As a, I'm not seeking to frustrate you in any way. I'm not aware of having given a ruling in well, the. Well, we didn't have to withdraw. You ruled, you ruled that Within that was a satisfactory withdrawal, Mr. Speaker. You ruled that that was a satisfactory explanation from the minister, and I disagree with your ruling. I am moving dissent from it. And uh, the, uh, therefore, I move the speaker's ruling be dissented from. You clearly have given a ruling, Mr. Speaker, and I am dissenting from it. So, Mr. Speaker. The uh, manager of opposition business pointed out quite clearly in the course of his remarks that uh, there are a series of processes in standing orders which have to be undergone if a member of parliament takes offence at anything which is said in this chamber directed personally at them. The effect of that has over the years been that uh, speakers generally have taken the view that when a member finds something offensive, no matter the what it is— The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The Leader of the House— uh, Mr Speaker, there is no motion before you because you've not been— uh, one, you didn't make a ruling, and secondly, you've not accepted uh, that a motion of dissent to that ruling could be given, seeing as there wasn't one. And on that basis, Mr Speaker, the uh, Leader of the Opposition is not entitled to address the House on a, uh, the basis of a fictional, a fictional uh, motion based on a fictional ruling. And on that basis, uh, he should not be given the call. As the Leader of the Opposition is well aware, I was in fact consulting the clerk to ensure that my understanding was consistent with uh, what I believe the standing orders would dictate. I did not believe I had made a ruling. Uh, I was allowing the Leader of the Opposition to continue his remarks until I had clarified that matter. I still not, do not believe that in the comments I have made I had actually made a ruling. I had merely reinforced the standing orders and said that I believe they had been upheld. The Manager of Opposition Business. How can you interpret Standing Order 78? which requires you to determine whether words are disorderly or offensive as not a standing order under which you just made a ruling that those words were not offensive or disorderly. I mean, no. how, otherwise, you, you have an obligation under the standing orders to determine. You've done it. We think you're wrong, and that's a ruling, and we are disagreeing with it. If it is not, then are you proposing to rule are you therefore proposing to rule the Leader of the Opposition's motion out of order? Um, the Manager of Opposition Business. The Manager of Opposition Business is aware that all that I have done, uh, clearly I did, I did um, indicate as I had yesterday that I, on, when I had an opportunity to look at the statement made by the Minister of Employment Services that the words were. Um, Offensive, they are offensive to the member for Dixon, and for that reason I required him to come into the chamber and indicate that he was not, in fact, uh, uh, faking those words at the member for Dixon. Now, now, and 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 the Minister of Employment Service had said that he was, in fact, prepared, had withdrawn them. Minister for Employment Services. Uh, uh, I move that so much of the standing and session orders be suspended as would prevent the member for Dixon from making a statement to forthwith explain her actions in relation to the 1996 preference selling deal between the ALP and the Australian Democrats. Come on, let's, let's have the debate. You say you want the, the debate, minister, let's have it. Come on, show minister, a bit of for what. Minister will resume his seat. Manager of Opposition Business. I raise a point of order, Mr Speaker. That motion is out of order. There's already a motion before the chair. Unless you are going to rule the Leader of the Opposition's motion out of order, this motion is not in order. You have to determine 
which you can't avoid ruling forever. One of these motions is out of order, and you have to determine which one. Yes, I, as the manager of opposition business is aware, in consultation with the clerk, and I can see that the leader of the opposition was continuing to address the chamber, not inappropriately. I did not believe that the leader of the opposition had a valid motion because I did not believe that I had ruled, and I have so ruled. Yes. But the, the, the Leader of the Opposition. We now have a clear-cut ruling. The ruling that you have just made, Mr Speaker, goes to the, uh, the view that uh, there was not a valid, rule, a valid matter before the House because you felt that uh, the request yesterday that this minister be required to withdraw the statements that he made, the withdraw the statement that he made, had been adequately dealt with by what he had had to say here in this chamber, and that uh, and that, su that you had sufficiently stand you had sufficiently exercised your jurisdiction under standing orders. Now, quite clearly, that is not the case, and you have now ruled that it is not possible for me to move a dissent motion. Uh, from uh, that particular ruling, and I now, yeah. and you have now ruled, and I move dissent from what I your understand. ruling has just, uh, that has just been delivered. The leader of the opposition will resume his seat. <laughs> leader of the House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government has afforded the opposition an opportunity to debate this matter. Uh, this is clearly, this is clearly a, this is clearly a fabrication. And on that basis, uh, we move that it be no further heard. The, the, the question is that the Leader of the Opposition be no further heard. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Is the division required? Ring the bells. Member for Banks. Member for Banks. Member for Banks.
Lock the doors. The question is that the Leader of the Opposition be no longer heard. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair and the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Corangamite and Hinkler tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Port Adelaide and Maribyrnong tell us for the nose. Order. The result of the division is ayes 75, no 60. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Manager of Opposition. I second the motion, Mr Speaker. This minister is a disgrace and the government's support for him is a disgrace and the, and the Prime Minister should be ashamed of himself of for supporting this scumbag. Will resume his seat. The question is that the Manager of Opposition Business be no longer heard. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Is the division required? Ring the bells for one minute.
Member for Cairn. Minister for Foreign Affairs. Minister for Foreign Affairs. Lock the doors. The question is that the Manager of Opposition Business be no longer heard. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. As this is a successive division, anyone entering the chamber should report to the tellers. I appoint the tellers as the member for Karangamite and Hinkler for the eyes and the members for Port Adelaide and Maribyrnong for the nose. Member for Barker, not in his seat. Order. The result of the division is ayes 75, no 60. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion of dissent be agreed to. The Minister for Employment Services. At the Australian Labor Party is in a deep political crisis, and the one thing they don't want to hear is the Member truth. Member for Employment Services will resume his seat. The question is that the Minister for Employment Services. Order. 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 The question is that the Minister for Employment Services be no longer heard. All those that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Is a division required? Ring the bells for one minute. As this, is a as this is a successive division, anyone entering the chamber should report to the tellers. When all the suicides over, I'll maybe jump to my feet. Lock the doors. <coughs> the question is that the Minister for Employment Services has been no longer heard. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair and the nose to the left. I appoint the members for Karangamite and Hinkler, tellers for the eyes. The members for Port Adelaide and Maribyrnong, tellers for the nose. 
Order. The result of the division is I 60, no 75. The question is therefore negative. 
Would members please quickly and quietly resume their seats? The Minister for Employment Services. Mr. Speaker, why are members opposite so scared of what Cheryl might say? Why are they trying to impose a vow of silence on Cheryl? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the Australian Labor Party is rock, is is locked the, into, a, into a deep crisis. The, a deep crisis, the and they don't minister, want to... The Minister for Employment Services, both the Leader of the Opposition and the Manager of Opposition Business, are aware that I cannot accept the resolution. The House has just voted that the Minister for Employment Services be heard. The Minister for Employment Services. Mr. S M Mr. Speaker, uh, why are members opposite so scared of giving the member for Dixon an opportunity to hear us, to, to, to speak? Why can't we let the this for employment services explain the, the Minister for Employment Services will resume his seat. The Leader of the House will resume his seat. Minister for Forests and Conservation. The, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the, oppos no, the, leader of the Opposition was. Uh, the, the Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The member for Cowan, the leader of the opposition, I, I, I have I have given an indication, understanding order, an opinion, understanding order 86, which in fact I would have, I would not have said I'd given a ruling. I would have given an opinion. But standing order 86 insists that should any of the questions be negative, no similar proposal shall be received by the speaker or the chair. And I have no other choice but to indicate they are the standing orders. Order, or you've ruled it out of order. There's no third position. Is my I motion in order or the, not? The motion, of the, the motion moved by the manager of opposition business is not in order. And I have ruled the motion out of order. The Leader of the Opposition. Anyone the in this of the place opposition. to move that a ruling be dissented from. Now, this cowardly bunch opposite decided to gag both of us when we were up on our scrapers speaking on that dissent ruling. Well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, as far the as we are concerned. Leader of the opposition there are double standards his seat. operating in this The Leader place. of the Opposition will resume his seat. Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is not entitled, not because of any ruling that you've given, but because of the standing orders. And you, can't, you, you, can move, you can move a dissent against rulings which require the exercise of judgment by the Speaker, but you can't move a dissent because you don't like the standing orders. And Mr Speaker, he used to be the Leader of the House. You would think he would understand just you would think that he would at least understand the elemental features of the standing orders. Uh, and, Mr. Speaker, one the last point. Of the House. One last point to make, Mr. Speaker, is that, uh, Mr. Speaker, the last point I make, Mr. Speaker, is that uh, the fact is that the suspension motion, the suspension motion, uh, expired. The time for that expired at 24 past. That motion, therefore, should be allowed to be put. And then we can hear from the member for Dixon. In order to facilitate the House, let me pick up the point made by the Leader of the House. The time allotted for the suspension of standing orders moved by the Minister for Employment Services has expired. As the question was not stated by the Chair, the motion lapses. The, question, the motion currently before the chair is a motion of dissent from the chair's ruling, which was not dealt with prior to the resolution moved by the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. 
seconding the motion to dissent from the ruling. Is that where we are in this The motion currently before the chair is a motion of dissent from the standing orders moved uh, beg your pardon, dissent from the speaker's ruling moved earlier by the leader of the opposition. It has not been dealt with. But, but the, to clarify the point raised by the manager of opposition business, all that the chair has sought to do is progressively deal with the resolutions before it. And the resolution currently before the chair is a resolution of dissent from the speaker's ruling moved by the leader of the opposition. And the, and the manager of opposition business will be recognised at the appropriate time. It's normal for the call to be given from one side to the other. The call. The, 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 clerk is in, the clerk has pointed out to me that not only my resolution but the clock furthermore reinforces the fact that the person who currently has the call is the Minister for Employment Services. The Minister for Employment and Mr. Services. Mr Speaker, the point I want to make is, is, is why are they scared of letting Amelitha Dixon speak? Why wouldn't they accept uh, our original, our original we, suspension? Because they're terrified. Absolutely terrified of what the member for Dixon might say. The member for Dixon is the booby trap at the heart of the Labor Party. That's what the member for Dixon is now. The Minister for Employment Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Dixon. The member for Dixon should explain exactly what she has had to do with the 1996 preference-selling deal between the Democrats and the ALP. She shouldn't leave it to Meg Lees to explain these matters. She was the, the Minister leader of the Democrats. The Minister for Employment Services will resume his seat. The Minister for Employment Services will resume his seat. The Chief Opposition Whip has been expressing perhaps understandable indignation, but he must appreciate the fact that it is neither appropriate nor necessary for the chair to recognise him when he is not in his position. I am, well aware, I am well aware of that, and the manager of opposition business is in the House. For that reason, I was unable to recognise the chief opposition whip. Manager of Opposition Business. If the motion before us is the dissent, he is not speaking to that motion no, and I is have... out of order and should be not be allowed to continue in that tone in I... this debate. Oh. But in any event, I move that he be no longer heard. I wonder if the Manager of Opposition Business, whose resolution is in, uh, would in fact like to reconsider that resolution. In fact, I had a, given the Minister of Employment Service a good deal of latitude. Anticipating, anticipating that he ought to come to the debate and then, as I trust the manager for opposition business noted, required him to resume his seat. Uh, I am, uh, if the manager of opposition business cares to withdraw his resolution, in fact, the Minister of Employment Services' time has almost expired. The, the Minister for Employment Services' time has expired. The question is that the Speaker's ruling be dissented with. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells for one minute. The Minister for Forests and Conservation. Minister for Forests and Conservation. The Minister for Foreign. The Minister for Forests and Conservation and the Minister for Foreign Affairs.
Lock the doors. The question is that the speaker's ruling be dissented from. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair and the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Port Adelaide. I oh, beg your pardon. Karangamite and Hinkler tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Port Adelaide and Maribyrnong tell us for the nose. The member for Dobell. There was, I understand, a one-minute ring of the bells. Uh, in fact, I am unable to explain to the House why there was a one-minute uh, uh, calling of the bells. And
The House will come to order. Member for Farah.
do not have the result of the division. That's why I couldn't respond to it. Speaker, as I, indicated, as I indicated to the Leader of the Opposition earlier when I was accused of ignoring him, I do not have the result of the division. Manager of Opposition Business. My point of order, Mr Speaker, is that at least two government members were admitted to the vote after you had required the doors to be closed. The member for Macon. Yes. The member for Macon and the member for Mitchell. Mitchell, Mitchell and Macon came in after the doors. They were standing here on this. The, I am. I am conscious of the matter raised by the Manager of Opposition Business and, in fact, have been conferring with the clerk about it. The Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, it, it seems to me, and on the assumption or the supposition uh, of an equality of votes, what the circumstances are, are clear, I think, to everybody in the House, yes. and, that, and that is that uh, there was an intervening debate but a one-minute division call. Now, Mr. Speaker, under, under, those, under those circumstances, the leader of the House has the call. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I did not, I did not hear all of the words of the leader, uh, manager of opposition business. But obviously, if that were the case, there would be two courses of action uh, available. Uh, I understood him to suggest that you could. Recommit the vote, which is which is which is which is which is, which is, which is not uncommon in the Senate, Mr. Speaker. Uh, or, fur or furthermore, Mr. Speaker, you could rely upon you could rely upon the leader of the House has the call. You could rely otherwise, Mr. Speaker, upon the general principle that for a vote to be carried, a majority is required. Or finally, Mr. Speaker. Uh, without uh, further checking my constitutional legal principles, but I put it to you, Mr. Speaker, that to, the to, chief opposition to put the, the chief opposition whip is out of order. To put the matter beyond doubt, Mr. Speaker, you would, of course, be perfectly entitled to exercise a casting vote so that the matter is dealt with expeditiously. The Leader of the Opposition. Is it not a fact that the result of the decision is the division is 57 votes all? The division has been conducted in accordance with the requirements that you have laid down, with the bells rung to your satisfaction and the, and the members who wish to vote entering this chamber to vote. It's 57 all, as we can all see here, Mr Speaker. That leaves you in the situation of a casting vote. Now, Mr. Speaker, you are now in the situation of determining between the dignity of the House and your job. When the House has come to order, including the member for Prospect, when the House has come to order, 
I would respond to the Leader of the Opposition by indicating that I do not have the result at this stage. No, I, merely, I, merely make, I merely indicate to the Leader of the Opposition that I do not have the result. The member for Farrah. The member for Lyons. The member for Farrah. The member for Lyons will be dealt with. The member for Farrah. If I, if I could, I would recognise you, and I now can, thanks to the member for Banks exercising some courtesy. Decision is in the hands of the clerks. The clerks are in a position to hand it to you. Oh, thank Mr. you, Mr. Speaker. What is the result? The leader of the opposition understands that I am not in a position to pronounce the result of the division until I have the division sheets. As the manager of opposition business is well aware, the clerk in fact makes the sheets available to the occupier of the chair when he or she is satisfied that the division is accurate. And, and I am in, well, simply awaiting that event. The, the, the Leader of the House. Just uh, prior to matters uh, being brought to a head, uh, Mr Speaker, I simply Mr. Speaker, I only put to you, uh, in response to the comments from the Leader of the Opposition, uh, the fact of the matter is that there was a one-minute intervention, and we can see people standing outside. Uh, the, fact, the, fact, the, fact, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, not too much of this should be made. It should simply be dealt with by either the casting vote or by the recommitment. Uh, and on that basis, Mr. Speaker, I mean that is obviously a matter for you. I would put to you the simplest thing is that this for you to exercise a casting vote, which no one doubts that you have. The manager of opposition business, the manager of opposition business, is in fact being a little less patient than is normally the case. I had just finished hearing a point of order from the Leader of the House. The result of the division is eyes 57, nose 57. The question is therefore not resolved. I have the power as the chair to exercise a casting vote. It would clearly be inappropriate for me to cast a casting vote um, with the eyes, given that I believe that my original decision was entirely appropriate. It would also be equally, in my view, inappropriate for me to exercise a casting vote with the no's, because I do not believe I should vote simply to maintain myself in office. For that reason, understanding order 208, it seems reasonable to recommit the vote. Yeah. Ring the bells for four minutes. The I will. The bells are being rung. There was an error. There is no error. There is no error. There is no error. That's a walkout. <laughs> Look at the whole thing. Thanks very much. Yeah, great. 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 
Barbarians. Right, terrific. Be proud of yourself, you hyena. That is great. Lock the doors. The question is that the Speaker's ruling be dissented from. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair and the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite and Hinkler tell us for the nose, the honourable members for Port Adelaide and there being, there being no tellers for the eyes, the question is therefore negative. The members, please quickly and quietly resume their seats. Leader of the Opposition. This House has no confidence in the Speaker. Oh. Mr Speaker, this is an unprecedented day. Stupidity. And this day is, has uh, arrived without precedence basically because of faults in your own rulings. You had an opportunity at the beginning of this day to uphold the standing orders of this parliament. The standing orders of the parliament, which you have exercised hitherto with rigour, 
on this side of the House and with some vigour from time to time on the other side of the House. There is, and it may well be, an oddball standing order in one sense, but there is an absolute requirement if a member of this parliament raises a point that is something that is said to them as being offensive that they are obliged to withdraw. And generally speaking, when a leader of the opposition gets up and asks for a withdrawal of a comment that has been made, it is withdrawn unreservedly. Now I realise you have a child on your hands and an unguided missile in the form and a bully in the form of the Minister for Employment Services, and that is a difficult thing for a speaker to deal with at the best of times. A difficult thing for the speaker to deal with at the best of times. But it is one thing to have a termagant on your hands, but it is quite another thing to allow him to get away with it. And what was required this morning of this character, who's gone out there for all over the last 24 hours, the last 24 hours in defiance of the concerns that you expressed yesterday, it was time to bring him to order. See, characters like Abbott, characters like this minister, uh, characters like this minister, are uh, invariably time bombs under their own decks. And the time bomb under this deck has blown up on you comprehensively, Mr Speaker, destroyed the authority of your speakership, destroyed the meaning of standing orders, destroyed decent behaviour in this House. Now the, the minister got up. Instead of being required to withdraw, instead of being required to withdraw at the beginning of proceedings, a simple procedure. He was allowed to stand up and lie in this chamber. He was allowed to stand up in this chamber and say, despite the existence, despite the obvious implications of what he had to stay and stand in the Hansard, and it's not an implication, it was a clear cut statement. He, uh, decided to deter he decided to excuse himself by saying all that his comments were were generic and then to compound that defiance of normal standing orders by getting up and, and, and uh, moving getting up and moving that the member for Dixon be obliged to answer a lie. That is what Abbott did in the, the minister did in this chamber. That's what the minister did. He got up. Minister for Forest and Conservation. On the point of order, nobody who's lecturing you should be using members' names uh, the when Minister they for know Forest the rules and of the House. Resume his seat. I, Minister for Forest and Conservation, the Leader of the Opposition in fact corrected the error he had made and for that reason I did not intervene. The Leader of the well, Mr Speaker, what the Minister has been doing over the course of the last 24 hours is cocking a smoot at you. The last, he knew full well yesterday you acknowledged your mistake and the way in which you acknowledged it you made it clear cut that if you had understood the full implications of the meaning of what uh, was said by the minister to the member for Dixon, then you would have required action on his part. And what the minister has been saying, what the minister has been saying over the airwaves since then is that he intends to come into this place and defy normal parliamentary precedent. And get away with it. And Stick get away with it. And how smart Alec I am. And he's been boasting around the benches of the parliament. Look, I'm the big bomb thrower. I'm the big deal. I'm the fellow who can get the opposition running. Leader of the opposition will resume his seat. The the the. the the Minister for Forests and Conservation will resume his seat. The Minister for Forests and Conservation will resume his seat. Minister for Forests and Conservation and the Leader of the Opposition will resume their seats. The and the Member for Lions is warned. Member for Hindmarsh, Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs will not conference in the chamber.
the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, what was said by the member, the Minister, yesterday was this. Now, Mr Speaker, yesterday the Minister for, member for Dixon, responding to a misleading statement from ACOS, issued a press release. Mr Speaker, she issued a press release. Mr Speaker, she didn't do live media lest she be asked the obvious question. How can you keep the so-and-sos honest when you're taking their money? How can you keep the so-and-sos honest when you're taking their money? Now, this is, this is plain language, Mr Speaker, plain language. It is a suggestion in this plain language this plain language that the member for Dixon had received a bribe. That was the implication of it, and it is against those sorts of implications that the standing orders stand to protect members. Stand to protect members. Then the minister came into this, this uh, chamber, firstly misled this chamber by saying that all he had said, that all he had said was a generic application to uh, Democrats as opposed to the. Uh, the member for Dixon, which is a defeat of plain language, I would have thought, that particular proposition, and then compounded this inter reasonable interpretation of it by getting up and moving a resolution in this chamber to try to get the member for Dixon to come in and state that she hadn't received a bribe. Classic when did you stop beating your wife type performance. Now, none of that would have happened if something very simple had occurred earlier in this day. Earlier this day. And that is if normal standing orders had proceeded. I was reminded earlier today of an incident in the Senate in 1988 when, uh, the, uh, when uh, my Senate colleague from Western Australia, Peter Walsh, described Senator Walters as a harpy. <coughs> Walsh then left the chamber after a withdrawal had been demanded. Left the chamber. The President of the Senate, and remember, the President of the Senate does not have necessarily a majority supporting him, sent the sergeant of arms down to Walsh's office to arrest the Black Rod down to Walsh's office to arrest him, to bring him back into the chamber to make a formal withdrawal. That was Doug McClellan. That was a presiding officer. That is what happened. That is what happened then. That was a president of the Senate determined to uphold the standards of the Senate. He was prepared to have the Black Rod arrest the minister to oblige him to enter the chamber to make a formal withdrawal. That's guts. That's defence of the parliamentary process. That was not actually required of you. A simple requirement of the minister at the table to get up and withdraw and I note recently you've developed this habit of uh, also asking for apologies, though I must say that's nowhere in standing orders that I can find. But nevertheless, it might have been useful on that particular occasion to ask for an apology as well. Because accusing somebody of taking bribes in the political process is a in anybody's terms, in anybody's language, in anybody's language, a, uh, an offence against standing orders that requires at a minimum a motion and backing up that motion with a serious presentation of evidence to that extent. None of those things, of course, were occurring. So that's how this whole imbroglio started. And then we proceeded to, after they, with their smart aleck efforts at, uh, at seizing the, uh, the standing orders in this place and, uh, and getting into us found themselves arguing against impossible propositions that rulings weren't rulings, <laughs> absurd propositions. Whenever you pronounce on the standing orders, you make a ruling. Whether the ruling is clear-cut in your favour or whether it's an area of discretion or whatever, it is a ruling. You make rulings when you're asked by members of parliament. You cannot sit in the chair and say, this is not a ruling. <laughs> I'm just giving you some sort of advice. Of course you can't do that. Everything you say from the chair because you're the presiding officer in charge of standing orders is a ruling. Every point is a ruling. A motion of dissent may be well based or ill based. And generally speaking, motions of dissent are rarely moved in this place. And you've got yourself you've found yourself in the situation, as I said, uh, only partially through uh, through uh, fault of your own. But at the end of the day, 
You have to be independent of all of us, and you have to make rulings. If we dissent from your rulings, then that is, uh, uh, then that is a matter for debate in this chamber. It is a perfect entitlement of all members to do it. But in trying to slip slide around that persistently, we finally get to a position where a ruling, a dissent motion, was acceptable even to you, and uh, your very strange interpretations of what uh, what a ruling is in this place. Now that dissent motion was then put before this chamber, and in the course of that dissent motion, the uh, the bells were rung. They were rung for a period of one minute. We, on our side of the house, suggested that perhaps they should have been rung longer. When we suggested that they should have been wrong, rung longer, you ruled. You ruled that we were wrong. You ruled, Mr. Speaker, that uh, that it was perfectly appropriate in the circumstances for the bells to have been rung for one minute. It is not as though there was any doubt in the minds of any member in this chamber. There was a small problem with that, in that one or two of the folk who uh, voted ultimately for you found themselves on our side at the normal closure of the division and were allowed, as you spoke, slowly to move to the other side in the course of uh, the oh, they came through the door after you had closed the two of them through. And uh, had they, of course, been locked out, it would have been 55, 57 against you. Now, Mr Speaker, then there was the vote. And the vote was 57 all. A vote legitimately, co legitimately counted in this chamber and a division legitimately held. A division legitimately held when all objections that could have been raised to it, that is, that the doors hadn't been sufficient, hadn't been quickly enough locked on the other side, and that, that one minute was not a, long, not a long enough period of time for the division to be held, had both been ruled on by you. Those were the only potential impurities in the division. The only potential impurities, and before the count was held, you'd ruled on both of them. You had ruled on both of them. And then, when you were finally had handed to you, after avoiding it for a period of some ten minutes, the clerk's recording of the division, you then stood up and said, well, as far as you are concerned, there was uh, a level of confusion, a sufficient level of confusion, for you not to cast your vote either for or against yourself and to invite a further division in this chamber. Well, Mr Speaker, there was no confusion. There was no confusion or error. You had given clear-cut rulings. There wasn't anybody sort of lying in the cross benches there who were counted twice uh, on one side or another by the tellers. There was no issue as to whether or not the particular bodies in the seats at the time were, the, were, were alive and, uh, and actually in the seats at the time. There was no, there was no issue as far as that was concerned. There was no question of a stranger in the House appearing to vote when the stranger should not have been voting. There was no question of that. There was no question of a member under suspension voting in the chamber and creating confusion and contaminating the result as a result of that. There was no person involved at all, no person involved at all in confusing the division. And any potential inadequacies in that division had already been ruled on by you and we did not persist with them. You made the ruling that a couple of characters who uh, were let in after the, uh, after the, the doors were supposed to have been closed could vote. Fine. We didn't persist with it. You made the ruling that uh, one minute was long enough for the division after we made it, after we asked for it. We did not persist with it. We accepted the rulings that you made and then it came to 57-57. Now you find yourself in the position of, uh, of working out what it is that you ought to be doing. You have to make a choice between your job and the dignity of this place between your job and the operation of the standing orders. And I'm afraid, Mr Speaker, you did not take the choice that most accords with the dignity of this place. Hence, we have been obliged to move no confidence in you. No confidence in the handling of the processes around this division. No confidence in the way in which you've handled 
this particular minister who has been treated with kid gloves, treated with kid gloves over the course of the last 24 hours. And I can recollect yesterday, I can recollect yesterday, one after another, our people being obliged to withdraw. And I cannot recollect one of those withdrawals involving an accusation on the other side that they'd been involved in bribery or that they'd been involved, they'd been involved for example, in, uh, in that particular case or incident which occurred in New South Wales uh, when, uh, a, uh, when in fact a, uh, a member of parliament, a senior Liberal, invited uh, the Shooters' Party to change their preferences on the basis of paying. We made no accusations to the Prime Minister on those matters, though he, of course, was the leader of the party at that point of time. We had plenty of opportunity to sling mud yesterday on those uh, particular matters, but we didn't. Only had we done so would we, have been found, we, would we have found ourselves in a position where somebody on this side of the House said something anywhere remotely as offensive, as was said by this particular minister. Now, this particular minister is, is the classic bomb thrower. Is the classic bomb thrower. He is he so proud of his he is so proud of his reputation that he does not care what happens to you. He does not care what happens to the government. He does not care what happens to decent standing orders in this place. He is utterly, utterly arrogant. Now, from time to time, from time to time, people who live their lives in a state of suspended adolescence arrive in this chamber. People who spend their lives in a state frozen in school debating techniques of their childhood, people who have never left the sand pit do arrive in this place and, of course, have no moral function, have no moral direction, no understanding of traditions that apply in this chamber, but only an utter self-centredness, an utter pridefulness an utter disregard for the basic decencies which dominate the political processes. And uh, those children really have to be stood on by speakers to establish their authority. To establish their authority. There is one child in this House now, and this is the child who has got you into trouble. But the child could have been dealt with you by you, Mr Speaker, so simply, so easily. You know, all you required of him was a simple withdrawal, a simple withdrawal. Then he could have moved his childish motion after that if he had wanted to. He could have moved his childish suspension of standing orders then if he had wanted to at that point of time, having been subject to the normal decent processes that apply to all the rest of us. But that, Mr Speaker, was not a course you took. You have made as a speaker error after error in your handling of this material over the course of the last 24 hours. You have allowed the chair to be defied. You have allowed the chair, therefore, to be defied in the way in which uh, this, uh, you have conducted yourself in this regard. And then finally, then finally, you have allowed a division to be bodgy. This House Order. can have no confidence in you at all. The yeah. of the opposition's time has expired. Manager of Opposition Business. In the motion, reserve my right to speak. The question is that the House has no confidence in the conduct of the Chair, the Leader of the House. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you are, a, Mr. Speaker, you are a good Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you are an honest Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, not one person. The Leader of the House will resume not his seat. The Leader of the Opposition was heard in silence on what is obviously a matter of great moment to the House and the occupier of the chair. Similar courtesy will be extended to the Leader of the House. Leader of the House. Uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, uh, you are a good speaker, you are a fair speaker, you are a, you are a highly respected member of this the parliament. Member for Perth. Mr Speaker, on, on both the sides— The Member for Perth. Mr. Speaker, on both sides of this parliament, uh, your decency, your fairness has been respected by all members. 
And only, only this week, Mr. Speaker, I have heard senior members of the Labor Party speak in glowing terms of you, not only as a person, but furthermore as a speaker, with the goodwill, Mr. Speaker. The member for Prospect. Leo, it's you. Uh, Mr. You're Speaker, with I the chair, Speaker, the Leader of the House. So is the member for Blacksland. The Leader of the House. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have heard members of the Labor Party say, despite their constant interjections, despite their constant interjections, uh, that you are a speaker. Uh, who has clearly exhibited a good will, the member for Denison, the bona fides of a speaker attempting to do what is everybody recognises is always a difficult job. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, as I member will, for Denison, uh, I hope forensically uh, uh, show in my remarks today all of the claims that have been made against you are uh, either completely and totally exaggerated out of all proportion or furthermore in some cases as as in some cases simply and completely fabric just fabricated just fabricated just to give you uh, you know a quick example uh, just to give you a, a quick example I heard uh, deputy I heard, leader of the opposition I can barely believe my ears but I did hear mr speaker the leader of the Member opposition Perth, say he said um, Everything you say is a ruling, and therefore attempting to justify some of the absurd motions that he moved this morning. Well, Mr. Speaker, I refer you to page 204 of 204 of the House of Reps practice, where in 1984 Speaker Jenkins, Jenkins named a member, and an attempt was made to dissent from his ruling in naming the member. The Speaker then ruled that the proposed motion of dissent was not in order, as he had not made a ruling. Now, Mr. Speaker, in other words, there is a Labor Speaker making the very point that you made this morning, and we had this, well, quite frankly, a stupid suggestion, a, but I say, Mr. Speaker, a malicious suggestion from the Leader of the Opposition, because he knows otherwise, Mr. Speaker, he knows otherwise because he's been a Leader of the House, to make that claim that those motions that he moved this morning in dissent were validly based. He, he knows to be wrong. And for him then to use that as justification for this motion shows you that when he's after you know, a political objective, in this particular case uh, the Minister for, the, uh, for Employment Denison. Services, this weak leader is prepared to attack a speaker who is well respected well respected by people on his own side. Speak well respected by people on his own the side. The member for Denison so simply attacking you, Mr. Speaker, and fabricating arguments for his own political purposes. Well, Mr. Speaker, that is that is weakness in the extreme. Member for Melbourne, weakness Force. in the extreme, and we utterly, completely reject it. As we will, of course, member completely uh, reject this uh, baseless uncalled for, unreasonable, for unjustifiable motion. Now, Mr Speaker, all this comes about uh, as of— The member for Denison is warned. Mr Speaker, this comes about because yesterday, uh, as is often the case in question time, there was a controversy. There was a controversy. Well, I don't think the member for Dixon should uh, you know, throw barbs in our direction when the manager of opposition used the word scumbag in the House this morning, reminiscent you know, of one of the worst, worst, uh, uh, the worst offenders the for in this House, namely uh, the former leader of the Labor Party, the man with whom the leader of the opposition learned some of his tricks, uh, the former uh, Prime Minister Keating. But, Mr Speaker, it came about because yesterday there was a fracas because, as Australia now knows, there have been federal Labor members in Queensland who have been associated with payments in cash, in brown paper bags, uh, to provide financial support to other political parties. 
and as one of the editorials, as one of the editorials, House member for Banks. I have a point of order in relation to the comments that the member is now making. I'd argue that this is a no-confidence motion against you, Mr. Speaker, we, and this is no, this is not relevant to the substantive the motion Banks will resume before his seat. the House. Member for Banks will resume his seat. The Leader of the House had prefaced his remarks by indicating why he was uh, using this illustration. The Leader of the House. Speaker, I am simply explaining the context in which this matter came about. And the Labor Party is very sensitive because one of theirs has been caught up uh, with the allegations of corruption being made in Queensland. That's why, That's why you are Member so sensitive for about it. Now, Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, the words used by the uh, Minister for Employment Services, and he can go to the details uh, of that. Um, he can go. He can. He can go to the details of those. Well, pass me over the quote. I'm sorry, I don't carry it around with me. You know, big deal. But what he referred to, Mr. Speaker, leader of the House has the call. What he referred to uh, was a slogan. Member for Dixon. A slogan of the Australian Democrats. And that slogan was, vote for the Democrats and we will keep the bastards honest. That is the slogan to which he referred to. And what he did yesterday, he, was, he referred yesterday in question time to the fact, to your great embarrassment, the Australian Member Democrats were receiving money from the Labor Party in a preference deal. Mr. Speaker, in the 1996 election, the party that says they would keep both sides honest in fact did a secret deal with the Labor Party. That is your embarrassment. Member for Melbourne and then, of course, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, then of course the member for Dixon, she joined the Labor Party and she's now on their front bench. No wonder you are embarrassed. No wonder, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, so what is the Labor Party's tactic today? We, they came in here today. Oh, they were so affronted. Oh, you know, after the years of abuse which they piled onto our side, he makes an obvious statement, namely that the Democrats, and in particular because she was the leader of the Democrats, that uh, the member for Dixon was involved in a deal to member receive money from the Labor Party in an exchange of preferences. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, they waltzed in here, oh yeah, full of fabricated uh, and confected concern and anger and angst about those particular comments. And Mr. Speaker, they had, of course, they had every opportunity, every opportunity to allow to allow the member for Dixon to get member up on her feet and explain herself. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, when, when it was obvious that they were so determined uh, to member have a Jager debate Jager. on this matter, we offered them the opportunity. The, the Minister for, the Empl for Employment Services actually moved a motion to suspend standing orders to provide her with the opportunity uh, to speak. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, many things member are said the in this Northern place. Territory. And, Mr. Speaker, when you considered the matter yesterday, when you considered the matter yesterday, Mr. Speaker, uh, you actually took a you took a different interpretation of what was said. And at the end of question time, I mean, you, no one in this house could ask more of a speaker than what you did yesterday, which was to stand up and honestly say, on the basis of what you had heard. And no one should forget, when you're sitting in the Speaker's chair, with the babble that comes from that side, you don't always hear every last word, but you had the decency and the honesty, Mr Speaker, to stand up and say, well, you'd heard these words uttered, you thought they meant one thing, and you were therefore prepared to go away and have a look at it. Now, Mr Speaker, seriously, can anybody uh, genuinely believe that any more could be asked of a Speaker? Well, I tell you what. When the Labor Party was running in this country and we had Labor speakers, we never had as fair a go as the fair go you yesterday provided to the opposition on this matter. And Mr Speaker, furthermore, you, were, you provided ample opportunities, ample opportunities in giving the opposition the call this morning. They were you know, up and down on their feet like a yo-yo this morning. Mr Speaker, the Minister for, the, for Employment Services uh, provided the context within which 
uh, he made his remarks, and that basically was the end of it. But of course, from the Labor Party's point of view, it can't be the end of it. It can't be the end of it because so embarrassed are they by this matter that they knew when they came in here, when they had the opportunity to put up the member for Dixon, what did they do? They attacked the speaker. They attacked the speaker. Instead of defending their own, because they don't trust her to get her on her own two feet to explain herself, oh no, they, they fabricate an attack on you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Deputy Mr. Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. And part of that fabrication was to say Member for Sydney. Part of that fabrication. It's the old. It's the the member for Melbourne Ports is not in his seat, and I warn him. It's, it's the, the third time I've had to draw his attention to what it's ought to be a courtesy to extended to all members in the House. That's the old tactic, Mr. Speaker. Oh. Put up, put up a straw man and say, "Oh, he alleged there was a bribe." What he alleged was that there was a deal for the passing of money between the Labor Party and the Democrats. And, he, and given the fact that the member for Lilly had, in fact, in the House publicly disclosed that and confirmed it, and we know the Leader of the Opposition he knows all about it because he's had them all in to explain themselves. How could you contest that? That was, in fact, a fact on the record in the House. And it is a shame on you that you should attack the Speaker as a political defence on your own part. Mr uh, Speaker, um, a couple of other matters uh, need to be said. Um, first of all, they, uh, I mentioned the point about the rulings. Uh, the fact is that the standing orders are the standing orders, and you simply implement those standing orders. There are times, there are times and circumstances under the standing orders where it's necessary for you to exercise a discretion, and it's quite clear from reading the standing orders. But, for example, in respect of the closing of the doors, uh, for example, in respect of the closing of the doors, Mr. Member Speaker, for prospect is warned. Mr. Speaker, uh, it's only a small point, but it just it does again just uh, contradict what the uh, leader of the opposition claimed. I mean, in respect of the closing of the doors. That, that's not a discretion for the Speaker you know, to sort of exercise to let a few in to suit yourself, which was the snide, unpleasant, totally unsubstantiated accusation. The fact is, this is, this is a requirement Member under for the law. standing orders. This doesn't require an exercise of your discretion. It's as simple as this. As, uh, as the standing orders require, the doors are closed. Full stop. Full stop. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, again, uh, just uh, sure, a small matter in a sense, but typical of the Leader of the Opposition, make any claim, regardless of the standing orders, regardless of the, regardless of the facts, because he's fabricating, fabricating a uh, completely baseless, uh, unjustified uh, motion uh, and arguments in support of it. Uh, Mr Speaker, in respect Member of the four Dennison. minutes and the one minute, uh, uh, I, I thought there was intervening debate. I'm, I'm, not, I'm now not quite sure whether there was or there wasn't, quite frankly. Uh, but I know this: we'd had at least uh, we'd had at least two, if not three, divisions beforehand. Uh, I do know the government won the election last time round. I do know, Mr. Speaker, we do have the numbers on this side of the house, and I do know, Mr. Speaker, I do know, Mr. Speaker, that some members of the house were off to the main committee. They were off to the main. They were off, off to their other job, if you like. And, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, they would have, naturally enough, if they had thought that there was going to be another division, they would have been entitled to think, as I think the Leader of the Opposition half admitted, uh, that they would have been entitled to presume that there would be a four-minute break. Well, there was a one-minute break, and I saw some of them standing outside. Well, quite frankly, so what? It's hardly the biggest deal I've ever heard of. So what? And, Mr Speaker, to show— Order. To show Order. The Leader of the House's time has expired. The Leader of the House's time has expired. The Member for Batman. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I second the motion. This is a crisis that arises because of a failure of leadership of the Prime Minister. It's his responsibility to point you into line. He had the opportunity yesterday not to put you in this position because he could have and should have required the Minister for Employment Services to come in here and withdraw, and he did not. 
He spoke to him after question time, but it's clear he did not require him to come in and withdraw, as he should have done. It is ultimately the responsibility of the Prime Minister to ensure that these people who misbehave in such a childish, irresponsible, rude and continually arrogant manner get pulled into line, not earmarked for promotion. And it is a failure of leadership. And it is an issue more serious, the issue we raise with you, Mr Speaker, about your behaviour today and why we have a lack of confidence in it. Accepting as we do that you've been put in an extremely difficult position by the irresponsibility of the Minister for Employment Services and the incompetence of the Leader of the House. Yeah, yeah. We do understand you were put in a difficult position, but this is not a minor matter. When we have a division in this House, the Constitution of Australia says how it should be determined, and it has not been applied. The Constitution at section 40 says Questions in the, arising in the House shall be determined by a majority of votes other than that of the Speaker. The Speaker shall not vote unless the numbers are equal, and then he shall have a casting vote. Now, that does not say unless he feels like us calling a second division. It does not say there is. It's a bit embarrassing. Let's have another vote. So, what cover did you, cut, did you develop on the best advice you had but not good enough? that you'd go for section 208 and say there was an error or confusion. The leader, of the, the leader of the opposition has clearly destroyed the potential argument that there was an error. There was nothing which occurred that was not known before the vote was declared. There was nothing that was known that did not establish clearly in advance that the vote was being conducted in a manner which you considered was proper and valid, was in, a in conformity with your decisions. Had the rules been more precisely applied, the vote would have been carried because the member for Mitchell and the member of, for Macon would not have been entitled to vote because they came in after the door should have been closed. But OK, that happened. But there's another reason why the vote was carried, that if the standing orders were being consistently applied, would have meant the vote would have been carried. One member on our side yesterday was suspended for 24 hours because the nature of her apology to you was not sufficiently grovelling. And you suspended her for 24 hours. And what she said, and in light of what you now know was the provocation that led her to do it, suggests that that was a much lesser offence than that of the Minister for Employment Services, for which you gave him the opportunity to repeat his remarks. didn't require him to withdraw them. You said, no, I repeat them, I reiterate them, and then I want to come in and move a motion to say the person who's aggrieved should explain themselves, not the aggressor, but the victim. It says the person against whom I made this slur no, should explain the basis of the slur, leader. but I shouldn't have to withdraw it. So if you had applied the standing orders consistently, the member for Fowler would have been in here voting and the motion would have been carried, yeah, and yeah. then we would have a very interesting situation, Mr Speaker. You wouldn't have had to worry about your casting vote. It would have been carried. Now, it's clear that there is no argument to support your position or the Leader of the House would have used it. But he did not use one. He thought he might get away with attacking the member for Dixon again. She must have had the temerity to win the seat they thought they were going to win. What a shocking thing! And This offence has been something for which she served a penalty of two years sustained attack from the Minister for Employment Services without justification or basis in fact. The things, the things which he said yesterday were not only scurrilous and unjustified, they were untrue. And they seem to be pretty good grounds for requiring them to be withdrawn. Now let me refer to you, Mr Speaker, to how you defended him against statements that were made about him. Yesterday I said, no wonder David Oldfield left, you were not good enough for him. Now, it's true that I said that. I still believe it to be true, and it wasn't generic. But I can tell you this. You said 
that you wanted to apply high standards and you asked me to withdraw the remark. And I did. I said, can I seek clarification? I will withdraw that qualification, but are you seriously saying that I have to withdraw something that I said to him, the Minister for Employment Services, when he does not have to withdraw alleging that somebody took money? Now, how can that be a fair application of the standing orders? That when we say he is lower than David Oldfield, which is true, and David Oldfield left, but it is not unparliamentary and it is much less an accusation than that which he made about the member for Dixon, and I, unlike him, have the defence of truth. My statement is accurate, his is false. It was preceded by another false statement. He said she issued a press release, she did not do live media. Even the presumption on which it was based was false. And then he went on to make false, unreasonable assertions, which the standing orders say absolutely have to be withdrawn. We understand that you initially misinterpreted his remarks, and we, critical as we are of what has happened subsequently, we did not criticise you for that. In fact, we bent over backwards to give you time to require him to withdraw. We said we wanted it done yesterday, but at the end of the sitting we accepted reluctantly your advice to us that he would come in this morning. And we accepted that you, in extremely difficult circumstances because of the character, personality and consistent pattern of behaviour of this minister, the only minister who's had to be thrown out of this place for his behaviour, and it probably rescued him from something more serious if you had not. Probably rescued him from something more serious if you had not, which in hindsight we may regret, but you did the right thing then, Mr Speaker. But we bent over backwards to say, yes, let him come in this morning, even though that meant the member for Dixon was subjected to that unjustifiable insult for the whole of yesterday, and it was reported last night. And while you were saying, while you were being advised that the minister was not available to withdraw it, he was out repeating it. But he said, oh, "I'm not available. I'm leaving. I'm interstate." He was out doing television interviews, repeating the assertion. But even then, we gave you time. Did you require a withdrawal? No, you gave him licence to reiterate. Now, it is an untenable position that you were put in, but the standing orders say how you should resolve it. You should resolve it by requiring this person to withdraw. It needed to be withdrawn. Everybody in Australia knew it needed to be withdrawn, including the Minister for Employment Services. He simply chose to defy you, and you chose to accept that defiance. You should not have done so, and it has led to this series of events culminating in that motion so incompetently handled by the government, but which led to the division which you are now seek which you sought to have recounted without a skerrick of justification merely because it was extremely difficult and embarrassing. Now that, Mr Speaker, is not an acceptable standard for us, and we cannot accept it. Now, it would not be, in my view, an appropriate course, but we are being left with little other for us to come in here and say the scandal which took place in the, the scandal which took place with the Liberal Party's behaviour during the Lindsay by-election was the responsibility of the Prime Minister. Yeah, we have be. never said that, even though he took the state campaign director who was responsible at the time and promoted him into his office. We have never said that it was the Prime Minister's fault. We believe it was a rogue element in his party doing the wrong thing. But perhaps it wasn't, given that he promoted the person who was running the campaign at the time and brought him into his office. But we have never made that allegation. We have never made the allegation that the very worrying claims raised by the Chief Government Whip last night about behaviour in the Penrith City Council, which is part of a link of events directly linked to the office of the local member, the member for Lindsay, we have never said even that the member for Lindsay knew about that, even though everybody involved worked in our office. 
We've never said that she knew about it. We've never held her responsible. We've certainly never said it was the Prime Minister's fault. Now, that, those allegations would be equally valid as the allegation the Minister for Employment Services sought to make, and we have never made them, and we will not unless we are forced to. But can I make it very clear? There's a lot more if you actually want to go down this road. But we do not wish to do that, Mr Speaker, and we do not wish your behaviour to force us to do so. But let us make it clear. We will not sit idly by while this minister continually, rudely, arrogantly and untruthfully attacks one of our colleagues. It will not happen. Each time he comes in, gets outside his portfolio, attacks our colleague, abuses our colleague and tells lies about our colleague, we will not stand idly by, we will stand and fight. And if you do not stand up for the standing orders in that process, we will be forced to say that the failure which he started has flowed on to you. And that is where we are today, the failure which this person started by his pattern of irresponsible, rude, arrogant, untruthful behaviour, the pattern of this serial offender which he started, has flowed on and you have been caught up in it. Now, that is not all your fault, but you had the capacity to resolve it and you did not. That is what has led to this motion. In our view, you should have resolved it yesterday and you did not. You should have resolved it this morning and you did not. We then led to a debate consequent upon that failure and we got into a very serious situation where a vote of no confidence in you was put and the government could not deliver a majority in support of you, Mr Speaker. They could not deliver a majority and you had to spend minutes pretending that you did not know what everybody here knew, what the result of the division was. Now, in my view, that is not consistent with Standing Order 203, which requires you to declare the vote. Sitting there pretending, I see no evil, I hear no evil, so I can speak no evil, is not an acceptable position for the Speaker. You had to accept that that vote had been counted and led to a result which was uncomfortable and difficult and caused by the incompetence of the Leader of the House, to which you should be coming accustomed. But it is not an acceptable position to fail to declare that, that, rule, that vote and then, when the vote goes in a manner which is unacceptable, to seek to have it recommitted with no provision in the standing orders which justifies that provision. And it is a very serious matter. It goes to the heart of how this parliament works. The Leader of the House said, well, it shouldn't matter because we won the election. Well, maybe we just call the parliament off and he could rule for three years or perhaps he could come in here with Rottweilers and a few people in masks. But we are not going to have the balaclavas and Rottweilers in here, Mr Speaker. We are going to stand up for the standing orders and we are going to stand up for our colleague and for the requirement that the standing orders be fairly, impartially and consistently enforced. And when that is done by you, you will have our support, and when it is not, you will have our censure. The question is that the Speaker be censured the Minister for Employment Services. The Minister for Employment Services will resume his seat. The Minister for Employment Services. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let me say at the outset of, this, uh, of my contribution to this debate that, in my opinion, you have been the fairest speaker that this parliament has seen, at least in the decade that I have been associated with it. And, Mr. Speaker, the fact. The Minister. The fact. I would remind members on my left that some of them have already been subject to warning. In fact, if the, spirit, if the chair is to exercise the authority expected of it, they will be required to leave the chamber. And Mr. Speaker, the minister has the call. And Mr. Speaker, the fact that members on this side of the House are from time to time 
accustomed to grumble about one or two of your rulings uh, is a sign of just how fair you are. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, in declining to exercise the casting vote to which you were undeniably entitled, you were showing yet again the high sparks of honour which have constantly motivated your occupation of the chair. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, I have to say that I deeply feel for you. Deputy I Leader deeply of the feel for you. Uh, Member for Burke, you're having to deal at this has point in time with a feral opposition, a feral opposition which is frightened of the truth. A feral opposition that is frightened of the truth. Now, Mr. Speaker, what happens? Minister today? resume his seat. The member for Patterson. I find the comment feral opposition offensive the and I ask the minister to withdraw. The member for Patterson will resume his seat. The speaker has heard, I'm sorry to say, a number of offensive remarks this morning, and I am allowing the minister to continue because I do not consider that the comment he used was unparliamentary. The minister. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker. If I were to be consistent. Uh, Mr. Speaker. I warn the member for Lawler, and if necessary, I will issue a general warning if that is the only way that the Minister for Employment Services gets an entitlement to be heard. I warn the member for Lawler. Minister. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, what happened today in the House uh, which sparked uh, which sparked uh, the behaviour of the opposition, which sparked the opposition's motion, uh, is that uh, I came in here and clarified a comment yesterday which had obviously been misunderstood, perhaps willfully misunderstood, the uh, by members opposite. Uh, having clarified my comments yesterday, uh, I, then gave, I then sought to give the member for Dixon an opportunity uh, to fully explain, to fully explain uh, her role in the 1996 preference selling deal and the Member most for important Sydney. point the most important point which has emerged member from for all the proceedings in this house today is that the member for Dixon has been gagged by her own side the member for Dixon has been gagged by her own side because her own side don't trust the member for Dixon to explain exactly what happened what happened in the course of that 1996 preference buying deal. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, what happened yesterday? I came into the House and— Minister, the member for Bendigo. Mr Speaker, this is a, uh, a motion of no confidence in the Speaker. It has nothing to do with the member for Dixon. I'd ask you to uh, get the minister to keep his comments towards that objective. Thank the member for Bendigo. In fact, the whole exercise in which the House is engaged this morning has a great deal to do with events that occurred yesterday, and I was endeavouring to lis listen closely to the minister's remarks. Minister. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, what I said yesterday was, uh, how can you, how can you keep the so and so's honest? Sydney. How can, how can you keep the so-and-so's honest when you're taking their money? That was what I said yesterday. Now it was, it was a reference, it was a reference to the fact uh, that the Democrat slogan in 1996 was "Keep the so-and-so's honest." At that time, the member for Dixon was the leader of the Democrat Party. There was, there was a deal, there was a deal. Uh, between the Australian Democrats and the Australian Labor Party, we know that there was a deal. We know that there was a deal because the member for Lilly has told us in this house. The member for Lilly has Minister, told us. Through Minister will resume his seat. Chief Opposition Whip. And no doubt, Mr. Speaker, that lack of confidence motion in you has been caused by this minister, but he cannot canvass that. What he should actually be doing is talking about why we shouldn't censor you rather than why we should be the censoring him. Chief Opposition Whip will resume his seat. For reasons that should be obvious to everyone in the House, with more intent, I suspect, than anyone else in the chamber, I am listening closely to what the minister has to say. He has not at this stage said anything that is unparliamentary, and for that reason I have allowed him to continue. I, more than anyone else in this chamber, have a vested interest in the minister's comments. The minister. 
Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the member for Dixon was the leader of the Democrats at the time. There was a deal, the member for Lilly told us. There was assistance provided uh, because the leader of the opposition has told us that there was assistance provided. Minister. And it's Minister. Chief Opposition Whip. Mr Speaker, my point of order is that this is a motion of no, lack of confidence in you. And what the, the government should be doing is saying why the, why the House should Whip. have confidence in you. He obviously doesn't. He's not willing to say so. Resume his seat. The Chief Opposition Whip is aware that the Minister has said nothing that is unparliamentary, and I am listening closely to what he has to say, and I trust he is merely building his case sequentially. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker uh, and it's perfectly reasonable for members on this side of the House to want the member for Dixon to come in and explain exactly what were the terms of that national deal. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, this motion is a censure motion of you. It is a censure motion of you. But clearly, from everything that was said, clearly from everything that was said, the minister will resume his seat. Member for Denison on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, your ruling that uh, the minister has said nothing unparliamentary. I will determine whether or not the member for Denison is heard. May be strictly and literally accurate, but nor has he said anything relevant to the motion before the you. And it's your Denison responsibility, particularly. Seat. I'm making a submission, the Mr. Speaker. The member for Denison will resume his seat. The member for Denison had made his point of order. It was a point of order on relevance. And I, and I indicated that the minister was being relevant. The mem member for Denison is obliged to resume his seat. Mem minister. Mr Speaker, in the course of this debate, there have been numerous accusations by members opposite towards, member for uh, prospect. towards uh, me and other members on this side of the House that we're getting personal. Well, any fair-minded observer of this House who is, listening, who is listening to the accusations that are being hurled from members opposite, who is listening to the filth and drivel that habitually comes from members opposite, would know that there is no getting personal on this side of the House. Minister will resume his seat. Member for Burke. Mr. Speaker, already once member this morning, the government will resume his seat, and another member is addressing the chair. Mr. Speaker, already once this morning, the government has failed to provide the numbers to support you, and now in this motion, they are not even prepared to talk to the issue of defending the you. It member is not for relevant. Will resume his seat. By any measure, by any measure, the comments made by the minister refer to an unfortunate incident yesterday, which has provoked. The me Chief Opposition Whip is warned. By any measure, the Minister is referring to an unfortunate set of events yesterday which has culminated in the actions this morning. I could hardly therefore rule him out of order. The Member for Franklin. Speaker, I would ask you to ask the honourable uh, member, the minister, to withdraw that comment of filth and dribble coming from this side. I find it very offensive. I am the first to agree with the member for Franklin that was an undesirable comment, and in fact, under my normal requirements, would, would re I would require him to at least refrain from that sort of statement. However, I have sat here in the chair this morning and for a matter of now two and a half hours heard a number of most undesirable remarks levelled at the minister. Minister. Chief Opposition Whip. Mr Speaker, the member, the member has asked for a withdrawal. Are you going to ask the minister to withdraw or not? I have indicated that I am not requiring the minister to withdraw, because if I were to be consistent because if I were to be consistent in my application of the principles, we would have spent a great deal of time making withdrawals this morning, and I'm simply seeking to facilitate the debate. Member for Chifley. Speaker, I rise understanding Order 75 and 76, and that is that the minister should not be able to impugn the reputation or make offensive remarks that the honourable uh, member of Dixon found offensive yesterday, and under the guise of this motion, 
uh, reiterate them again today. And I ask you to uh, ask him to withdraw it and enforce those standing orders. If, yeah, yeah, yeah. if, the, if the minister were to say anything that uh, the member for Dixon found, if the minister were to say anything couched in yesterday's remarks that reinforced the slur he had made on the member for Dixon's reputation, I would be the first to require him. The, the statement I have just made, as the leader of the opposition, as the deputy leader of the opposition is aware, I imagine because he will have conferred with the manager of opposition business and the leader of the opposition is consistent with my entire remark to all people who were in my office yesterday. Minister. Uh, Deputy Leader of the Opposition. goes to this debate. If in fact you have now admitted what he said yesterday was a slur, why don't you require him to withdraw it as the standing orders require? The as the Deputy Leader of the Opposition is well aware, if in fact the chair to require all slurs made in this place withdrawn, sadly, sadly we would spend little time in debate. I, I have dealt as fairly as I can with this issue, and I would want to use the remaining time to facilitate the minister for obvious reasons. The minister. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. The further point of order, Mr Speaker, is that withdrawal can come about through two courses. One, your requirement, and two, as a result of a request from the minister defamed, ask, the member defamed asking, which is exactly what the member for Dixon did yesterday. And on every other occasion, when a member has asked statements slurring them to be withdrawn, you have required it of them. You have required it of us on every occasion. You were given the opportunity to reflect on this over 24 hours. Clearly, that reflection has come to a conclusion. It was a slur. She asked uh, it to be withdrawn, and it should be on her request. Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, members opposite, one of the marvellous marks of your speakership is that members opposite have not been able to bully you the way the Leader of the Opposition staff try to bully front benches opposite. The Leader of the Opposition staff have got more ticket than the Leader of the Opposition. That's the problem. They've got, the staff have got more ticket than the Leader of the Opposition. Now, Mr. Speaker, now, Mr. Minister. Speaker, The member for Denison. That is an absolutely disgraceful behaviour. And he still hasn't said anything nice about you. Minister. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, 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 one, the one basic point that has emerged from all the proceedings this morning is that members opposite are in fear of their political lives. They are absolutely terrified that they will be consumed by the fire that is burning the Beattie government in Queensland. And Mr Speaker, you are a marvellous speaker and you fully deserve the confidence of this House. The question is that the motion of uh, that the motion of confidence in the speaker. The question is the motion of confidence in the speaker. I recognise the member for Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Explain. The <laughs> member for Fisher is warned. <laughs> <laughs> you ought to talk, Mr. S Mr. Oh, yeah, speaker. And so to... is the member for Swan. 
Mr Speaker, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to speak, although I do not consider myself accountable to the Minister for Employment Services, the member for Fisher or anybody else sitting on this side of the yeah, chamber. Yeah. In fact, Mr Speaker, I abhor the hypocrisy and dishonesty of the member, Minister for Employment Services and for the way he calls himself a practising Christian. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I make this point because you told me yesterday that the minister could not be asked to withdraw because he was in transit. In fact, he went straight from this house, scuttled out of this house, knowing that he had said something specific and not generic and repeated accusations to a doorstop, of which I, I have uh, um, a transcript. And amongst other things, he said, where did the money go? Did someone pocket the money? Certainly Wayne Swan has admitted that the money was paid over. And this is where the connection takes place, Mr Speaker. He said, what happened to it? Cheryl Kerner was the leader of the Democrats at the time. Make that connection, Mr Speaker. But the point, Mr. Speaker, the reason, the reason that I mention the reason that I mention my abhorrence of his hypocrisy is he went from that doorstop to Paul Lynham's funeral service. The com car drivers told me that he arrived at 4:30. Obviously, he thought it was more important to get out there and continue to defame me than than to uh, to go to the funeral service. But I want to point out. That I think I have a perfectly valid right to point to the hypocrisy of a man who, who willingly joins in these words. This is the man who considers himself a, a specialist on Catholic doctrine. He goes in to Paul Lynham's funeral and joins in the hymn. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil Member for side. Dixon. Perfectly Member relevant. Perfectly relevant, Member Mr. Speaker. Member Dixon will resume her seat. I, Member for Dixon has the call. I think I could reasonably be to have presumed that there was someone seeking. <laughs> the member for Aston, I believe, was on his feet. She's missing her space. I am not seeking from the member for Aston a point of order. I am seeking an assurance that he was, in fact on his feet when I interrupted the member for Dixon. Mr Speaker, I was merely going to raise a point of order on the question of relevance. She's, the, speaker, the member for Dixon was not addressing the question that's before the House. The, the member for Aston will resume his seat. Mem I merely want to indicate to the member for Dixon that my intervention was as the result of a genuine belief, in fact an observation, that there was someone on their feet. Speaker, we all remember what uh, the Minister for Employment Services said about Greg Wilton's funeral. We all remember what he said in here, and we all remember what he did less than two days after. And I think that the point the leader of the opposition, the point that the leader of the opposition and the manager of opposition business has made about this minister being a serial offender, is a point well made. And it is where this issue began and the comments that this minister made and which I asked to be withdrawn and which you failed to act on. And, he now admits it's and that, a yes, and which you now admit has, was a slur on my name. And Mr Speaker, I regret, I regret that we have to have this debate today, but it was in your hands yesterday. You allowed a minister to say what he said with intent, with intent to smear. I'm not accountable to him. But I am very happy to talk about the circumstances of the preference negotiations. I have nothing. <laughs> Minister, <laughs> Minister for Aged Care. Do you want us to start there? Member for Dixon has a call. That proves our case, though. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the minister's remarks about my role as leader of the Democrat obviously have nothing to do with his portfolio, but that's never stopped him before. I was the leader of the Democrats. I am grateful for the opportunity that afforded me to contribute to public debate in this country. And I resigned, unlike others, I resigned Member from Parliament. Member for Eden Monero. 
I resigned from parliament before recontesting a seat for the Australian yeah, Labor yeah, Party. Yeah, yeah. And despite your best efforts to defeat me, as a member, as the leader of the Democrats, I was travelling around the nation quite extensively, but I did take part in some telephone conference hookups. I am aware that at the national executive a decision was made to direct preferences to like-minded candidates first, and then no, you are wrong. And then, in a split ticket, to both the Liberal Party and the Labor Party. That is in the Senate. After that, Mr. Speaker, conversations were held with members of the preference committees of both the Liberal Party in every state and the Labor Party in every state. The Liberal Party is not excluded from these conversations. And as a result of these conversations, I find myself in the ironic position of, of having been part of a decision which recommended preferences against the Leader of the Opposition, the then member for Brand. So it's not simply about it's not about and then, Mr Speaker, the Democrats announced that that preferences were Minister that preferences were directed to X number of Member for Page. X number of Liberal seats and a X number of Liberal seats and a similar number of Labor seats. It's as simple as that. Mr Speaker, I was not involved in the campaign for Lilly or in the state discussions about those allocations. I know nothing about any donations about any donations, and I join Gary Gray, Robert Ray and Meg Lees, who speak with authority on this matter. I do know that Senator Bob Woods did approach Senator Vicky Bourne with all sorts of offers. I do know that. But I do accept well, I mean, I, I think the minister is being deliberately misleading in attempting to single me out as a member of a party. I was the leader, but to use his to, to use his argument, John Howard should then be responsible for the actions of the former Senator Bob Woods in uh, negotiating preferences and how to vote card printing with the, with the Shooters Party candidate in the by-election in Lindsay. So I, I categorically reject, Mr Speaker, any association with this decision or any money which may have changed hands. And that is why I was extremely disappointed in you yesterday when you failed to uh, require the minister to withdraw that statement. It was not a generic statement. It was a specific statement. It was said with intent to smear, as we know, has been the actions of this minister ever since the day I joined the Labor Party and he began peddling his poison about me to the press, some evidence of which I have, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, The member the minister does not have the call. And neither does the member for Dixon. But the clock is ticking because the minister cannot be heard. As he now can be heard, he has them call. On the point of order, Mr Speaker, she said I poisoned people against her and I was doing this consistently, and she said she had evidence. The, Produce the, the, the evidence. Minister will resume Please. his seat. Minister will resume his seat. That is no valid point of order. The, minister, the member for Dixon. Was he seeking a withdrawal? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, anybody listening and watching this debate would be asking why are we carrying on like this? Well, 
I'll tell you why, Mr Speaker. Because it's about the style of John Howard's government and the abuse of this parliament in lying and defaming people almost on a daily basis. And we on this side have had enough of it. And we've particularly had enough of it from this Minister for Employment Services. Some old cynics would say, "'Twas ever thus." Mr Speaker, there's a very big difference between the argy-bargy of daily politics and the use of this chamber to daily, daily smear, smear and slur against the character and reputation of members on this side. It is your duty to uphold the rights of people on this side as much as you do of, this, of your government by virtue of the fact that they are ministers. And I take great exception to people leering and jeering from the other side, from a man who vilifies the unemployed, calls them job snobs and said you can't trust politicians. I take exception to a person leering and jeering who presides over a crisis in aged care. I take exception to a minister involved in telecard rorting. I take exception to the many ministers who have failed the Prime Minister's own code of conduct and continue to occupy the front branches on the government's side. That's what it's all about. That's what it's about. That's why we are passionate. That's why we are passionate about it. Mr Speaker, unfortunately, unfortunately, Mr Speaker. Unfortunately, Mr Speaker, your failure to defend my rights to have that slur against me withdrawn yesterday when I asked for it, when the minister has misled you about his inability to come in here yesterday and do it by telling you that he was in transit, it causes us to reflect on the way you have exercised your authority in that chair. I did come to see you. you I, I'd be very happy to put that on the public record, and I am still dissatisfied with the result of the outcome. Because, Mr. Speaker, this is the result of where it's been repeated all around this country. Because you didn't give me the protection that I asked of you, and I object to that too, Mr. Speaker. And I told you so. So, Mr. Speaker, in conclusion. We, we do need. We do need. <laughs> Member for Dixon has the call. Mr. Speaker, we do need to look at the way you have conducted yourself in this particular aspect of the debate. We do need new, fair, to both sides standing orders, which are relevant and where truth matters. Where truth and relevance matters. That's why our passions are inflamed. That's why I talk about Paul Lyman's funeral. That's why I talk about the man or nation that chooses the darkness or the light. The Minister for Employment Services always chooses the darkness. The question is that the member for Denison The, man, the deputy leader of the opposition, the deputy leader of the opposition, and the minister. Deputy Leader of the Opposition and the Minister for Arts and Centenary of Federation have just illustrated the very remarks between each other that each other would want withdrawn and the difficulty the Chair has had intervening this morning. The question is that the House has no confidence in the Speaker. The Minister for Arts and Centenary of Federation. Uh, the first thing to say at the outset of this no, uh, no confidence motion is that Nobody believes you are anything other than nonpartisan, able, fair, balanced and decent in your behaviour in the, in the chair and outside it. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition this, me this no is one of those occasions where uh, political emotions on both sides run high, and the simple fact is 
that it's a grave mistake to attempt to shift the blame to the umpire. There's something of the John Kerr syndrome at work here, uh, in that the Labor Party will dump onto the person who refers it to the proper voting procedures or processes the ultimate decision. So you are the subject of a no motion confidence simply because, sim simply because you put the vote to the parliament. Where is the gravity of, of that error of judgment as alleged by the opposition? You simply left it to the parliamentarians to resolve the issue. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think it is odious of the opposition to bring this matter uh, before you in, by way of a no-motion confidence. Mr, Defe Mr. Deputy, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the interesting thing is that the Labor Party, having run two years of shock tactics in the House, of, of organised disruption, of, of calculated noise and interference, interjections, points of orders, so that they've overturned decades of established reasonable behaviour and restraint by parties on both sides of the House, they now try to take the moral high ground. And it simply doesn't work. And it simply doesn't especially work to involve you in it. You have been a reformist Speaker of the Parliament. You have attempted, in the face of daily provocation, at times from our side, and you have dealt with people on our side. I have been subject of your warnings. Members on our side have been evicted from the House. We respect you for it, but the opposition does not because they constantly test the boundaries of your authority. And when, Mr. Deputy, when, Mr. Speaker, you refer the final arbitration of this prolonged and at times complicated exchange this morning, they cry foul. They cry foul because the parliament resolved the issue as it ought properly. Mr. Deputy, Mr. Speaker, let's, let's look at this matter sequentially. It started yesterday when there was a dispute about the interpretation of the words used by the Minister for Employment Services. Now, Mr Speaker, the, the fundamental issue is that you, if I understand you correctly, came to the conclusion that the minister was referring to the Democrats generically or as a party. And uh, as you explained yesterday, you had a different interpretation at, from that put on the minister's words by the member for Dixon and by the Leader of the Opposition and the Opposition at large. The dispute then arose about um, how to interpret those words and to what extent you would require withdrawal, but the minister was not in the House. You then, with typical fairness, balance and goodwill, uh, for which you are rightly known, undertook to examine the record. Which brings us to today. Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, the, the minister was spoken to. The minister gave an explanation, and points of order in rapid fashion followed. Uh, you then, to try to resolve the matter, sought confirmation that the minister had not meant to reflect personally on the member for Dixon, and that he withdrew any reflection on the minister. And the minister did so. The minister, <coughs> as I correctly understood him, to say was that he was referring to the Democrats. Now, this was not good enough for the opposition, no, because they wanted to stage manage an attack on the Minister for Employment Services and, in doing so, were prepared to sacrifice the member for, for Dixon. They, they, they care not about her own personal position because it was clarified this morning, but instead they were prepared to trample on her standing confuse the issue and muddy the waters, all for the purposes of attacking the Mem Minister for Employment Services, and you also were to be treated in the same fashion as the member for Dixon, cannon fodder for their political opportunism and their political objectives, because it should have been good enough for the opposition, the minister's explanation and your acquiescing of it this morning. But of course, it was never going to be good enough because they had a political agenda that they were going to see whatever, whatever the cost, whatever the cost to the dignity of the parliament. Yours has not been infringed or compromised in any way. I can't say the same about the parliament, 
but the Speaker rose above it. You properly and faithfully adhered to standing orders. You showed extraordinarily, extraordinary cool and calmness and patience uh, under constant provocation for more than one hour. There were dozens of interventions directed your way by way of points of order, questions and insults. Make no mistake, Mr Speaker, nor have you, but with good grace you have, you have decided to ignore or overlook the personal barbs thrown your way. So, Mr Speaker, if anyone is to emerge from uh, this heated debate and conflict this morning, it is you. Mr Speaker, to continue the, the, um, the events of today, um, you f properly fulfilled your duty as a Speaker, which is to determine whether words need to be withdrawn. You did so. You took the Minister's word, as you do for all members. You were not affording the Minister for Employment Services any special treatment nor favouritism. You, 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 you dealt with him in the same way you do all other members, but you had secured his withdrawal anyway. It, this, is, this will still not be acknowledged by the opposition that the Speaker obtained the, the uh, Minister's withdrawal and clarification in any event, so that all the nonsense and attack that has followed, culminating in, in this phony no-confidence motion, were uh, totally unnecessary. Now, in the divisions that followed, a vote was tied. You had the right to, 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 um, to rely on a casting vote, on, on the dissent against yourself, again showing the highest personal and professional standards. You did not give a vote in your own cause. It would have been the easiest thing for you to simply vote to strike down the malicious and contrived uh, motion of dissent by the, uh, moved by the opposition. You, you did not do so. Instead, instead, you relied on your own judgment in that you believed your ruling was correct. And indeed, it was a correct ruling originally. Now, speakers must make such decisions, and it's not for oppositions or governments to complain because the decision, if fairly and properly reached by the Speaker goes against them. And that's what it is. The, the Labor Party will never accept the umpire's decision. Never will. So the simple fact is, Mr Speaker, you are now the target of the opposition because they seek to attack the Minister for Employment Services and, and the government at large. And never forget, all of this, all of this could have been curtailed if the opposition had agreed to the minister's suspension of standing orders to allow the member for Dixon to state her case. It's as simple as that, and this is a debating forum. They, they sought to, they did not want to let her. I'm sure the member for Dixon, not that I dare speak for her, but most members of this parliament would have welcomed the opportunity. She, she, she has been boiling with frustration, understandably, and wanted her opportunity, the dispatch box, to put her case and to set the record straight as she sees it. Yet she was prevented from doing so from 9.30 this morning until midday. Two and a half hours the member for Dixon had to cool her heels when she, when because of the Labor Party. They ruthlessly exploited the member for Dixon's position so they could attack the Minister for Employment Services. Mr Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker in the end, you had to resolve this matter after what um, you may well have considered a misjudgment or error in not allowing a four-minute bell, uh, division bells to ring by, allow, by calling for a, a fresh division. Now, that's, that's, simply, that's simply common sense. Where, where there was, if there were, with respect, Mr Speaker, a mistake made in the length of the division bells, which excluded a large number of members from participating, as is their rightful responsibility, in the division, you call for another division. Why, why Mr Deputy Speaker, would the Labor Party object to a democratic vote in the House of Representatives? Mr Deputy Speaker, your action, your action was courageous. 
the, the easy thing for you to have done was, would have been to vote with the noes against the motion of dissent against your ruling. And the simple fact is you, uphold, you upheld the best traditions of that chair in taking the decision you did, which was to put it back to the members of this House. And there's no escaping our responsibility to decide these matters. As the Speaker has said on a number of occasions and his predecessors, the, the conduct and behaviour of this House is in the hands of the members itself. So it was a brave decision, Mr Speaker, which, which to any fair or balanced member of the House has only enhanced your standing as, chair, as, as Speaker of the Parliament. Mr Speaker, who, who really in this chamber would believes in this no-confidence motion? Who really believes in it? The opposition don't believe in it. We have seen a number of your predecessors who, who behaved in an undisguised partisan way, who trampled on individual rights, and, and there are very few in recent memory, Mr Speaker, who, has, who have brought the same sense of fair play and non-partisanship to the chair in the way you have. But I hasten to say I don't, I don't name anyone in particular. But we all know that not all speakers have thrown aside their political bias and the too, and the too many and there, have, there are reputed to have been speakers in the past with close relationship to the leaders of their parties, uh, to the point where some might have accused them of doing their party's bidding. But I don't want to be deflected, Mr Speaker, from the issue at hand, which is a motion of no confidence in you. So the simple fact Chief is— opposition whip. So the, the Chief the, Opposition <laughs> Whip is already under a warning. Every time a minister, and often with backbenchers, rises to his or her, her feet, there are family insults coming from that side. There are the most, there are the most personalised attacks every day, and we we don't complain. We accept that it's part of the culture and part of the moral corruption of the Labor Party. And then, and then they think they can, in an institutional sense impose their warped values on the parliament. And when we won't tolerate that. It's one thing for you to engage in your personalised um, fantasies. It's another thing to tear down the parliament's traditions by way of a com completely unjustified, completely unnecessary motion of no confidence in the speaker. Mr. Mr. Speaker, you have acted in the rightful way all through this. Your track record and your two years in the chair has been one that you should be not personally proud of, not that you seek any acclaim or any congratulations, because you have brought a degree of balance and fairness to the conduct of this House that most, if not all, of your predecessors would envy. And it is a sad occasion that the Labor Party, for the basis of political purposes, seeks to draw you into what is a parliamentary debate, fierce as it may be. That is unjustified, it is uncalled for and has potential ramifications for the parliament as a whole, whoever may occupy the government benches or the speaker's chair. Mr. Deputy, Mr. Speaker, the government and in, the, in their hearts, if not their consciences, the entire opposition reject this motion of no confidence. Member for Batman will resume his seat. The Minister of Forest and Mr. Conservation. Speaker, during the address just concluded, the Chief Government Whip made substantial reflections on the chair, and I ask he withdraw. He was not a participant in the debate. Mr. The Speaker, I may happily withdraw any imputation that I made against the chair or any other member in this House. Okay. And it's I a pity the, the Minister doesn't would... either. Why did you do it? Member for Batman. Mr Speaker, the, the government obviously thinks so much of you and your position. They have had you defended today by two rotors and a spiv. You demand more respect than that, Mr Speaker. Member for Batman. Where is the Prime Minister, the Mr Speaker? Batman. Why isn't he here defending the, the you, member, pulling that bully boy the, into line? The member for Batman knows that as much tolerance as I have exercised in the chair, the remarks he made would not be acceptable by, by any speaker at any time. Mr. Speaker. No, the member for Batman has the call. Mr. Speaker, 
The member for Batman has the call. Out of absolute respect for you and your position, I unconditionally withdraw those remarks. I only wish others the applied for the same respect as to you. Yeah, yeah. That's right. The question is that the House has no confidence in the Speaker. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. Is a division required? Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question is that the House has no confidence in the Speaker. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite and Hinkler. Tell us for the ayes. The honourable members for Port Adelaide and Maribyrnong. Tell us for the noes.
Ellen and Lee, Horn and Snowden, Kerr and the two Fergusons, Jacko and Price, and Price, Lawrence and Evans. Side bottom and Gillard, Byrne and McFarland, Liversack and Moose, Garrick and Eric Ellis, Spoon over the Rudd, Zara and Corcoran, Cox and Danby. Quick and Ripple. Thompson and Mellon. Robert Roxon and Wilkie. Burke and Livermore. Gibbons and Alvin Emerson. Latham and Emerson. Griffin and Paul. Jenkins and Morris. The result of the division is ayes 60, no 78. The question is therefore negative. Would members please quickly and quietly resume their seats? Clark has the call.
Member for Prospect. I'm sorry to do that to you, Mr Speaker, but I seek the call because I didn't wish to do it during the debate that has just occurred. But understanding Order 78, during intervention at 9.55 this morning, when I made a remark that the Leader of the House was directing the Speaker, the member for Sturt said, and I quote, Janice, you have been hanging around with the League of Rights for too long. I completely want that withdrawn. I do not like my name even mentioned with that fascist group, and I the think it for, should be withdrawn in the House. The member for has indicated where she was misrepresented. I ask the I think it is entirely reasonable for the member for Prospect to be indignant about that association. I ask the member for Sturt to withdraw it. Mr. Speaker, the uh, comment that you've been hanging around with the League of Rights too long was designed to make a commentary on her Sturt, paranoia, member, her member paranoia for about withdraw. the use of the microphones. Member for Sturt will but I withdraw, withdraw in deference that to you, statement Mr. and resume his seat. No member for Sturt will withdraw without qualification. Without member for Sturt, withdraw the statement, Mr. Speaker. Member for Sturt. Member for Lilly. Mr. Speaker, I seek leave to make a personal explanation. Does the member for Lilly claim to have been misrepresented? Yes, I do, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Mr. Speaker, a report in today's Courier Mail suggests that when I was the Queensland ALP campaign director for the 1989 Merthyr by election campaign, I agreed to pay for a printer's cost of the how to vote cards of an independent candidate to secure a preference deal which favoured the ALP candidate in that election. Mr Speaker, I deny absolutely that I offered any form of inducement in return for preferences. The facts, as I recall, Mr Speaker, are these. I recall a meeting with the independent gay law reform candidate Ms Wilde to discuss the then State Labor opposition's attitude to gay law reform. In 1989, there was no prospect of a gay law Lilly reform candidate directing preferences to the then Conservatives. Given this context, Mr Speaker, our discussion centred on the prospect of gay law reform under a future Labor government. So I offered no inducement of any sort to anyone at the meeting to direct preferences to the ALP. Mr Speaker, I note today's QMR report su suggests Mr Summerfield, Ms Wilde's campaign manager, believed that given Labor's attitude to gay law reform, there was little question about Ms Wilde's preferences being directed to Labor. Mr Speaker, I have asked the Queensland branch of the Australian Labor Party to conduct an urgent search of its record of that by-election campaign to ascertain whether or not any printer's costs were paid. I state for the record that I have acted with complete proprietary in this matter. I believe that the timing of this unsubstantiated Member allegation over ten years after the by-election took place and other allegations from a Member range of political Lilly sources in recent days Mr. Speaker, are malicious and can Member only be Lilly's designed to smear my name. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The clerk. Government business.